Now on Discovery Channel, the Salvage Squad goes all out for the Golden Ford and sets its sights on the Brooklyn's Benz. This week we're taking a drive down memory lane to a time when men were men. And women were women. We didn't have the vote, but we did wear the trousers at home. We're here in Buckinghamshire in search of the mother of all cars. The car that was at the start of the revolution that is modern motoring today. It's a 1911 Model T Ford. And this one's got a bit of a pedigree. Ask any kid to draw a vintage car, and they'll come up with something that looks pretty much like a Model T. After a few early reliability problems, they went on to become the world's first mass-produced car, with Ford building 15 million of them between 1908 and 1927. They came in all shapes and sizes, but the one we're after is unique. A sexy lady with an exotic name, the Golden Ford. She first burnt rubber back in 1911, not on the roads, but at the races. This place is amazing. It's an automobile graveyard. I know what a thrill you get from rusting metal, Claire. But which one's ours? That is a very good question. We're sport for choice here. We are. Well, fortunately, here's a man who knows. Neil. Good morning. Good morning, mate. Hello. 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 So come on, where is she hidden? Well, it's none of these. It's in a shed around the corner there. Great, can we have a look? Yep, not a problem. Marvellous. Neil Tuckett is Mr. Model T, the foremost restorer in Europe. The bug got him when he inherited this old van from his uncle. And soon, he'd given up farming in favour of restoration. Now his workshops turn out about one a week. But the one we're after is so special, it's kept under lock and key. Oh. Hey, hey. Oh. Look at that. I presume this is the car. This is a unique Model T. Uniquely in need of quite a lot of work, Neil. Yeah, it's unrestored. Oh, an amazing thing. You can see it all. There's nothing hidden here. But you can also see there's a lot of hard work. Oh, that's your job. <laughs> <laughs> well, Claire, while you find out how much work it needs, maybe you could tell me a bit more about it, Neil. Everything about this baby is a bit different. This is not a standard Model T Ford engine. It's got overhead valves and a larger air intake, which means it's more efficient and therefore more powerful. Normally on a Model T, you'd expect the wheels to have wooden spokes like a cart, but this one's got metal discs. Very, very strong, very aerodynamic. This car has so much personality. I mean, look at the steering wheel. It's low down, it's mean, it's nasty, it's racing, it's heading forward. So where did Neil pick up this one-off? I found it on a farm in Herefordshire. Um, the old boy had bought Model Ts in the 60s and he'd collected this off a farm somewhere nearby. Uh, it was all in bits and boxes. We knew it was something interesting, but we didn't know what. In the early 1990s, um, we'd, we'd worked out what the number plate was on the old radiator, and I saw a picture of it in one of these books. And uh, then we realised it had some racing history. And here it is at... Uh, Brooklands in 1912. And here's a picture of it. Oh, that's fantastic. With the with body, and that's when it was known as the Golden Ford. That's really beautiful, isn't it? None of that's left. Unfortunately, the body doesn't seem to have survived. I imagine it was pretty dazzling when it yes, came down. Yes, quite a sight to see. Claire, come and have a look at this. That rusting hulk in there. Isn't that beautiful? Look at the shine on it. Yeah. Gorgeous, Even isn't it? Even on a black and white photo, you can see all the reflections. All the reflections. Absolutely. That's right. Well, here's the deal, Neil. We think it'd be daft to take it away to get the mechanical restoration done somewhere else, seeing as you're the mechanical expert. But what we thought we would do is take it away and get the lovely bodywork done at Coach Builders. Would that suit you? That sounds good to me. I'd yeah, does that, that suit you? Yep. Fantastic. Yep. Well, that's the deal. You're on. And hopefully, Neil, the next time you see it, it'll be at Brooklyn's Racetrack. Oh, excellent. All shiny and beautiful. Well, I'm looking forward to taking it up the test hill. Fantastic. Well, all I've got to do now is go and try and find someone who knows how to build this lovely coachwork. Are you off to the library, then? It would seem that way, Claire. Can't keep you out, <laughs> then, can we? See you later. Good luck. Bye, then. 
Our goal is to have the Golden Ford screaming along the famous home banking, what's left of the Brooklands racetrack, the world's first purpose-built motor racing circuit. We also want to fulfill Neil's dream of powering her up the famous Brooklands Test Hill. Back then, a good time was 7.9 seconds. Quite a challenge for Neil. And if we aren't going to push her up, then Claire and Neil are going to have to sort out her chassis. See how far out it is, Pete. Tune up her engine and attend to a very dodgy rear wheel. And I'm going to have to find some little company who can help us restore her wonderful brass body. This week's challenge takes us to the dawn of the automobile. It's a 1911 Model T Ford. But this one's no black banger, it's the Golden Ford, a brass-bodied thoroughbred with a pedigree to prove it. And whilst Claire and her owner, Neil Tuckett, get to grips with what's left of her, I'm out on the road burdened with questions. Why would the ultimate utilitarian vehicle like the Model T Ford be turned into a racing car? Why was it chosen? And more importantly, what happened to our car, the Golden Ford, to make her what she was? I need to find a historian, somebody who knows about these kind of things. And I think I know where to find one. Right, Neil, I know it's in one hell of a state, but we're going to start... Back in off. the workshop, and Neil and I are thinking about sparking her up. It sounds like absolute madness, doesn't it? But it does work. These things, they're so simple that if you put a battery on it and you set fire to it, it sometimes works. Right, you jack the back wheel up. Yeah. Because that makes life easier. Normally, I'd be a bit wary about starting up an engine like this without yeah. first having a good look inside. Makes it easier to swing. But Neil's the expert, and it's his engine, so here goes. Go on. Ah, <laughs> <that's> action. <laughs> it wants to go. Yeah. You just hold that about there. Make sure it doesn't. Yeah. sort of started, but it isn't exactly environmentally friendly. To make it clean and mean for the pits, we're going to have to rebore the whole engine and tune it up. The rest of the work should be fairly simple. We'll need to check that the chassis is OK. Replace the spoked front wheels with discs like those she had in 1913. Luckily, Neil's got two lying around. But the tyres are ancient, so a new set will need to be made. And then, of course, there's that wonderful brass body, a brilliant mix of sexy good looks and true Grand Prix aerodynamics. This is one of my favourite bits of restoration, taking it apart. You don't know what you're going to find or if it's ever going to go back together again. But one very, very small spanner. One very, very big spanner. It's got to fit somewhere. Oh. There it goes, one radiator. <laughs> Once upon a time, this car would have been a bog-standard Model T, but almost 100 years ago, someone did one of the world's first custom jobs on her and rather conveniently left their calling card. You've just got to keep your eyes open when you're taking these things apart. George and Jobling, Newcastle upon Tyne builders. All these clues to its past. So what did George and Jobling do to turn a standard Model T into a racing car? First, they got rid of the bodywork and the rear seat. They removed the old petrol tank and dropped the driver's seat back along the body and stuck it low over the centre line. Down went the steering wheel to where the driver could reach it and the pedals got shifted to the right. A small petrol tank was put between the steering wheel and the engine. The engine was beefed up with overhead valves and anything else they could think of and they got rid of the spoked wheels and fitted solid discs. Finally, they added that super sexy body and the Model T became a racing car. The only thing that remained standard are the brakes, which were next to useless on the road and positively deadly on the track. So with the car in bits, we have the beginnings of her history. She was made by a bunch called George and Jobling up in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. 
but who drove her all those years ago? To find out, I'm heading right to the birthplace of motor racing, what's left of the Brooklyn circuit in deepest Surrey. While Henry Ford was designing the Model T, across the pond in the UK, the British were building the world's first purpose-built racetrack. On July 6, 1907, the first race was started at the new track, and it marked the start of a golden era of motorsport. It had taken nine months to build and cost over £150,000, a small fortune at the turn of the century. And this is it. Over the next 30 years, records would be set and broken, and this track would become synonymous with motoring success. At three and a quarter miles in length, with two huge banks 30 feet high, motor racing soon caught the public's imagination. And the brave young chaps who took to the circuit soon became household names. Fame and fortune, not to mention women, followed them on and off the track. Deep in the archives, I'd discovered that the driver and owner of our car was a chap called A.E. George. One half of George and Jobling, who owned a Ford dealership up in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. It's right here that 90 years ago, A.E. George and his fearless chums tuned their cars into fearsome racing machines before taking their lives in their hands over there on the hallowed track. But what was a Geordie car salesman doing risking life and limb on the Brooklyn's banks? I'm hoping motor racing historian David Burgess Wise knows the answer. The people who came down here were the pioneers, brave men who wanted to go faster than anybody else, and the dealers who came down here, people like A.E. George, they had something to prove. Perhaps more than the wealthy amateur, they wanted to show that their make of car was the best. So that's where the phrase, win on Sunday, sell on Monday came from. Exactly. And racing a Model T Ford, <laughs> I can tell you, is a pretty dangerous pastime. But this is how the Ford first appeared at Brooklands, just a strip chassis. Uh, George, being a motor trader, knew the easiest way of making a car go quickly was just to throw the body away. It's so that's just what he did. One seat, and in fact he made it so light that he had to put a piece of pig iron over the back axle to keep the wheels on the track. So really it was nothing but a giant pram with an engine. Well, exactly. And if you look Then at in the 1913, George covered up the pram with its super sexy brass body. But why? Wheels. It's the only racing car I've ever heard of that had a polished brass body. And I suspect it was done for publicity rather than any increased performance. Because obviously, among all the aluminium and painted cars, a polished brass car would have stood out like a ray of sunlight. The cars might go faster today, but so much else is the same. Even at the dawn of motor racing, the whole thing was about getting your car seen. So the common punter would come and part with the readies down at the dealership. But standing out from the crowd wasn't just a matter of a brass body. You had to win. And to do that, you need to beef up the engine, which explains my trip up north to engine specialist Cottrell's, who've been giving our engine the full McLaren treatment. Every bearing's been coated in white metal and remachined, and each cylinder rebored. When it fires up next time, not only will it be as good as new, it will be as powerful as when A.E. George raced her at Brooklands 90 years ago. But when I got back to the workshop, all was not well. Neil and his assistant Peter had discovered a problem with the chassis, which could literally knock us off track. We've got a hump, we've got a, well, we've got a dip here where the engine sits, so we've got to get that uh, out, and we've got to get rid of this twist. It's not surprising that the chassis has a bend or two. The banking at Brooklyn's was an unforgiving place, and with brakes little better than a bicycle's, a prang or two was inevitable. But what's the best way to fix a race-bent Ford chassis? Simply flatten it with another Model T. Right. I'm not really going to drop the car on it, are I you? am, honestly. Yeah. The only way we're going to get straight. We don't want to fix two like Model T's. Yeah, somewhere there. Good point. Somewhere about there. Right, happy with that? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Nervous. Doubting me. It will work, have faith. Are you absolutely sure? Coming down slower. Yeah. Inch. Right, go oh. for it. 
Touch in now. Right. You can see go. it bending. Which way you go? <laughs> this is the great thing about the Model T. It is so simple. This chassis may look like a bed frame, but it's made of high-tech metal. If we've managed to straighten it, it will be the only thing keeping the car together at speeds of over 75 miles per hour. Level along the top now. Right, that's pretty good. That side's not bad either. Is this my present? Oh, yes, here it is. Oh, brilliant. Look at that. With the chassis flattened, we can turn our attention to our reconditioned engine, a three-litre brute of a thing. Ready? Yeah. The original Model T engine was designed as a plodder, but by changing it to overhead valves, A. George was able to get the fuel in and the exhaust out much faster. The result, more revs and more power. How so, much more power? Um, I think we're about 45, 50 horsepower instead of 22. He's doubled yeah. it. Also, the compression so, ratio has increased at the same time. So on that little tiny flimsy car, yeah. Yeah, he's doubled the amount of power. Yeah. It must have just I mean, shot along. Oh, it was. It's very quick. Can you imagine turning up? Everybody else is there with all their cars. And you turn up with what they think is a Model T Ford, and then someone spots the overhead valves. Yes, yes. But, uh, there must have been people at the start line yeah. not knowing where to put their money. No, that's right. The next job was rebuilding the car itself. Look at that. It just looks like an horrible old bit of wood fit for the wood burner. But if you turn it over, there's our maker's plate. It's got to go back on the car. Good basic oh, seat. Look at that sack. Agricultural sack. Our Model T is all about speed, so every little thing counts. Fitting those original disc racing wheels not only makes her look the ticket, but they'll cut down on wind resistance. Even though our car is unique, deep down it's still a Model T, the world's first mass produced car. In total, there were 15 million of them made, coming off the production line at the rate of one a minute. I mean, was he cutting corners, Neil, in order to get the profit? Yeah. Um, no, not really, but he was saving money. Um, if, if, for example, uh, you realise he was producing 10,000 cars a day, and he was saving one bolt, the one bolt worth one cent became $100 a day. Well, one cent's nothing. Yeah, but $100 a day was one man's wages for a year. So that was saving money. It starts to add up. Yeah. With the engine ready, it's time to drop it down onto the chassis. Right. Let it down slowly. Nice and slowly, Pete. Yep. It's the heart of our car, and even in 1911, no boy racer was going to be seen without an extra big exhaust. It looks That's fast. It looks like a looks racing great. car exhaust. Yeah, that, There's that, that, no silences on this one. Good world. So everything's bigger and better on this one. Yep, this is definitely go faster stuff on here. Gradually, our golden Ford is coming back to life. But now we've found a problem with the steering column. I've got the steering wheel, but we've got a problem. To restore this back to being a single-seater racing car, it has to have its steering all in the centre. And at some time in this car's later life, someone shifted it all to the right-hand side, which means we've got to bend everything back. Smile. It's going to fit. Yeah. We've sorted the steering column. Now we've got to bend the pedals back to the centre. They're the originals, so we don't want to snap them. Hence the heat and the strained faces. Bring it a bit. How's it going? Well, we're getting there. Just got to do a little bit of fiddling with these pedals. What's the difference going to be between driving a bog standard ordinary Model T and this racing one? Um, you've got to you, be mad to drive this. Yeah, you're going to be much more cramped in this. You're not be able to see what you're doing. Your feet will have to be on instinct. Actually, it's going to be tiny, isn't it? Yes, By the time tight. we've got the bodywork in here. Yeah, just right for you. <laughs> <laughs> Keen to see our car in bits, I raced back from Brooklands, armed with loads of info about A.E. George and our car's heyday. But it seems the workers have been on strike. Hello. What's happened? Well, we've rebuilt it. It looks exactly the same as the last time I saw it. It's all been to pieces and then been put back together again. Might be got on it there. Yeah, that looks good, doesn't it? Mr. A. E. George. The fact that Claire and the boys had done the mechanics so quickly shows just how simple these old Fords are. But there's one thing bothering me. There's no point fitting the bodywork till we've checked out that she really is a runner, safe enough to burn rubber at Brooklands. Now we're going to have to test this car, and I think I know just the place. 
Come on, let's get her loaded up. That's the way, come on. You realise if it goes backwards, you're the one who's going to get flattened by it. It's a bit of a gamble, but it's worth a try. Ford must have a test track, and surely they couldn't refuse one of their firstborn. Straight back. Work. Well, thanks very much, Neil. You've done a great job. We're going to take it away and have it thoroughly tested, but I'm afraid the bad news is you're not going to be able to see the car again until it's been fitted with its bodywork. Well, I'll miss it being in the workshop, but uh, I look forward to seeing what uh, you can achieve. Well, hopefully, with its beautiful brass bodywork, it's going to look like a dream. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Thanks Cheers. a lot. As long as we don't kill it at the test track. <laughs> <laughs> Cheerio, boys. Bye, Claire. Bye, then, Claire. What finer place could there be to test our fabulous racing car than here at the Ford Test Track? This is our last chance to find out if there are any really serious technical problems. It looks the part, but it hasn't really been driven in anger yet. Now, what young, brave young fool would dare to drive this thing? Who else but Claire Barrett? Yes, she's our test driver for the day. It's me, and I have every faith in Neil and Pete's engineering skill. But this thing is capable of doing 70 to 80 miles per hour, and it's like nothing else I've ever driven before. It's unbelievable. The throttle is up here on the steering. If you hit what you would normally consider to be the brake pedal, it's actually reverse. And the brake is actually where the accelerator is. So basically, you need your head on back to front, Claire. Just doesn't bear thinking about it. if you get into a panic and hit the wrong thing. That's it. That's me all over the test track. Well, all I can say, Claire, is the best of British. I'll get it started up. I can't tell a lie. I really am pretty nervous. I just don't know how I'm going to react if something does go wrong. And if it does, the brakes, I'm not kidding, are next to useless. But even if the chassis performs on the test track, I'm still going to have to infiltrate Ford's European Design Centre to help Claire turn this old pram into a golden chariot fit to rip on the deadly banks of Brooklands. This week's challenge, the restoration of the Golden Ford, is going pretty well. We've managed to do all the mechanical work in double quick time. But before we rebuild her brass body, we're going to have to check she's up to taking on the treacherous banking at Brooklands. This is the first time this chassis has run in anger for probably 60 years or so. So anything could happen. With only two gears to choose from, I'm getting pretty sceptical about this car's mythical speed. However, there's only one way to find out. Change up to the top. She's a very brave girl, but unless I'm very much mistaken, it isn't half wobbling. Even though I had a Tony Blair smile pasted to my face, I was bricking it. Every time I hit 40 miles an hour, the steering just went to pot. <laughs> the back end was just kicking out all over the place. It can't be the chassis or the axles, because we fixed those, so it has to be the wheel itself. Clay, you're still alive. It's absolutely brilliant. I was trying to be sensible, but it just wants to go fast. The one main thing is this wheel, though. I could see behind me it's wobbling all over the place. It's really throwing the back end of the car out. So we're going to have to get that straightened out. So that's going to have to be done. But apart from that, she's running like a dream. She's re she is ready for her bodywork. You did look very like Lady Penelope in the wacky races. Oh, I love it. I don't want to give this one back. It's really, really good. <laughs> On that lovely smooth test track, that back wheel was doing its best to kill me. There's absolutely no way I'm going to burn rubber on those crazy bumpy bends at Brooklands unless it's fixed. 
With Claire getting rid of her wobbles, I've been given the task of getting the body sorted. And for that, I need a plan, man. I'm in the heart of the Ford Design Center for Europe. I've almost had to sign my life away to get in here. It's top secret. From here, all the designs are conceived. It's big business and it's big bucks. My contact is Matt Jones. He might look a bit art school, but I'm told he's a whiz on the computers. So, Matt, where did you start designing our bodywork? Well, we had these photos and not a lot of information on them. Took the measurements off the chassis and came up with this here. If you look at it from the front, you can see how we've put in the, the track dimensions and the chassis dimensions and the radiator. And all the bodywork is made from the photos, which is sort of guesswork, really. Oops, it's come out like that. And if we give it some color, Lovely. It starts to look a little bit more like a yeah. car. Yeah. And how confident are you you've got something on body work I can work with? Um, reasonable, because luckily with this system we can, if we see a side view here, we can give him a drawing of that, and he'll be able to measure off the drawing, scale drawing, exactly what he needs to make the body. All right, here we are. With that done, it was time to get the plans off to our coach there builder. Good luck. It's been great doing business with you. OK, <laughs> cheers. cheers. While Suggs was mucking around with supercomputers, I was heading north with my wobbly wheel to probably the only firm in the country who'd be able to fix it, Specialised Automobile Services. These guys are pretty much the best in the business. There's not a car worth owning that they've not made a wheel for. We've got Steve Hopkins, the big cheese himself, to straighten ours. Right then, Steve, are we going to see exactly how wobbly this is? Yeah, well, let's is? get it on the jig and see what happens. I'll hold it in position if you want to put the bolts on. This is pretty much the last chance saloon. If it doesn't work, there's no way we can make a press to stamp out a new one. We have to make it work. It looks fairly bad. It's not even sitting on the jig properly. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's just see exactly how far this is out. Well, it's quite wobbly on the car. Wow, look at that. That's terrible. How fast were you going with that? I got it up to 50 miles an hour. 50? And the guy in charge of the track kept going, slow down, I'm not slow surprised. Down. I'm not surprised. That is absolutely horrendous. Yeah. <laughs> What's actually caused it to buckle like that? Well, looking at it, you've got a, a weld here. That's not the original manufacturer, is it? No, 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 no. I think sometime in its life it's had a fatigue crack. Somebody's tried to weld it, do a repair weld. And as soon as you put any heat on a disc, and it's going to buckle exactly like that. Oh. So can we repair this? It's a difficult one. It's a very difficult one. I think the only way we're going to be able to do it is to cut round there, make a new centre, and hopefully, when we weld it back up again, <laughs> we don't have the same problem. <laughs> Cause it's a buckle. What do you think the chance of success is? Well, putting any heat on a disc wheel like this always causes problems, so slim to none. But we shall give it a try. Now, being organised, I sent the measurements on ahead and they've actually made up the central hub. Now, all we have to do, and I say all, is prepare the wheel and weld this in position. It probably won't work, but we don't really have a choice. We have to give it a go. The idea is to use the new hub as a flat surface on which to bolt our bent wheel. By tightening the nuts bit by bit, we should gently coax it back into shape. OK, let's get going. Is it time for the gas out? Yes. Hey. This might seem crazy, but the first thing Steve must do is butcher our beloved wheel, cutting a hole for the new hub. Right, Claire, get a big hammer, we can knock it down now. There we go. Wind the monks up. With the hub fitted, it needs to go back on the jig, and bit by bit, just a few thou at a time, Steve tightens the bolts, bringing the wheel back into alignment. Fighting. It's getting better all the time. It's then we can begin to weld it all back up again. Now comes the hard bit. As soon as we go anywhere near the thin bits of metal with a welding torch, they're going to heat up, expand and buckle in all sorts of interesting ways. If we're not careful, we're going to end up creating a wheel worse than the original one we had. The alternative is to spend £30,000 on a brand new one. And we haven't got that money. This is the moment of truth. 
If we're going to fulfill our promise to Neil and get the car screaming at Brooklands once more, then this has got to work. There you go, Claire. What do you think of that? Oh, it's not bad at all, is it? Considering how it was before. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little bit of distortion there, but it's not too bad. I think we can live with that. Thanks very much. It's fantastic. You're about to do 150 mile an hour on that now. Yep, don't tempt me. I'm going to get that back to the workshop and straight on the car. The only thing we need now is a set of tyres. Rubber might start growing on trees, but before it's a tyre, the black stuff's going to have to spend some time with Dunlop, being pulled, stretched and rolled into shape, just as it was 90 years ago. The real skill begins when each of the layers is glued into place by hand and the edge is built up. This rubber band is then placed inside a vacuum mould to give it its basic shape. The final part of the process is sticking it in an oven, squirting in water and baking the lot at Gas Mark 4. The result? One set of 1911 racing tyres. But one steaming tyre does not a golden Ford make. Which is why I've signed on with the firm of Rod Jolly, one of the best coach builders in the business. And as usual, I'm late. These flat sheets of brass are absolutely beautiful. And I can't believe that we're going to actually bear to start folding them and turning them into a real car. It's going to take a long time, but it's going to be worth it. I feel a bit like a Zen monk learning at the feet of a master. Rod Jolly's the person you go to with your two million quid's worth of bent Lagonda. I better pay attention. Oh, I see you got the photograph there of the original car. How are we going to achieve this in real life? Um, <clears throat> well, we'll be working from the uh, obvious dimensions that are given to us in the photograph. Um, we know that the radiator is correct. Yep. Um, we, we know that the shaft is correct. What things do we have to change on the car at the moment? Uh, we will have to change probably the, um, the body very slightly because the steering does appear to be higher than it is in the photograph. Um, no, I've actually driven this already and it's incredibly cramped as it is. If you yeah. drop the steering wheel, we'll never get in it. Yeah, that's right. No, we can't lower the steering wheel. Clearly it needs to be drivable, so um, what we've got to do is to actually change the bonnet line very slightly and just bring that up a tiny bit there and just bring the cowl up a little bit more. So if we look at the photograph there, is the seat correct? No, the seat is obviously, uh, obviously high. So um, I think we'll have to dispense with the, with the seat and make a, a purpose-built one for the job after we've built the body. Right. Well, should we get on with it, then? Yeah, let's go for it. Sadly, it's going to be a long time before I can get my hands on that brass. The first job is to make a wooden frame or butt based on the plans that Suggs got done at Ford. this sort of temporary skeleton in order to fit the brass bodywork on over the top. So all this hard work is eventually just going to be thrown away. But I'm still not being allowed at the brass. The next task requires scissors rather than tin snips. Before so much as an inch of the golden stuff is cut, we're going to have to make the whole body out of card. Then, when we finally get the snips out, we'll be able to fold and cut along the dotted line with confidence. Well, I think it looks pretty close to the photograph. Got a basic outline there, something to work to, isn't it? In paper. Yeah. We're not getting reflections. No. It's just paper engineering, but it's looking pretty close. How long is it actually going to take to turn it into brass? Believe it or not, there's uh, near enough four weeks, four 40 weeks? Hour weeks for one man. Put it out. We did, that in a, we did that in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
While Claire works on the Golden Ford, I've tracked down a lady of a similar vintage. Amazingly, A. E. George's daughter, Clara, is still alive, and I'm going to Surrey to meet her. Apparently, her dad was a keen cyclist, once representing South Africa. But he gave up cycling after a particularly nasty accident and moved to England in search of further adventures. I mean, he, he was always had his eye on the, on the next new thing. And he loved speed always, you see. You know, he had a, a motor engineering business. They had five, six branches over the northeast, Glasgow, Hexham, Lake District, all over. But his first love was always racing the things, not selling them. Even seaside holidays were devoted to the sport. Softburn used to have racing on the beach and used to compete there. And I used to go there sometimes with them and watch them racing. George raced the Golden Ford between 1911 and 1914. He won dozens of races, most notably when he lined up against one A.B. Coulthard to go on and win the Ford Cup at Brooklands. Presented by none other than Henry Ford himself. But all that success didn't come without its dangers. Once when he was racing, for some reason the car was in flames, exhaust trouble or something. But he finished the race just the same and came in second with a blazing car. That was just my father. He was always different. A. E. George certainly was different. The Golden Ford is the only car we know of to be built with a solid brass body. And looking at its replacement, you can only wonder why. Well, since we last saw the bodywork, it's really moved on a pace, and I think it looks absolutely fantastic. Has it been a difficult job to do, Rob? No, it's a fairly straightforward job. The main thing that we had to do is be very, very careful about marking out all the rivets, drilling the holes in the correct position, mm -hmm. and making sure that we, we don't put any scratches on the material because it's a polished body and we can't afford any mark or any errors at all. At last I can lay my hands on the gold stuff itself. And then we've just got to try to ease a little bit of shape in. If you can put a hand either side... Are you sure about this? ease a bit of shape in like that. What we're trying to do is to create a sharp shape at your end and a general curve at my end. Yeah, you know, there's no machine in the world that would do this for us, so we just have to use a bit of old pipe and anything we can lay our hands on, really. And a bit of old drain pipe. That's it, old drain pipe. <laughs> we absolutely have to get it right first time. All right, it's scrap. Absolutely. The whole job's off. <laughs> With the bonnet cut and bent, the next job is to mark out the holes for the rivets with the help of the wonderfully named Chalky, also known as Eamon Fuller Love. You've seen uh, that photograph, the yes. original photograph. Are we using the same sort of construction methods? Yeah, absolutely. That's the way all cars were riveted together and boats and planes were all riveted together with this method. You on? Yep. Have you always worked on racing cars? Um, most of my life. Um, but I worked at, I started at Lotus, and I went from there to Brabham's and mm -hmm. to McLaren's. That's all the big guys, isn't it? Not much about. Um, I just picked up the skills. I was taught a lot of skills, you know, at Lotus. And that's working on, the cars then must have been aluminium. Yeah, they're all monocoque aluminium cars. And um, the t technology didn't change until probably the 80s when carbon fibre came along and um, actually put a lot of us out of business. With the last few cuts to the brass, the body is almost finished and we are ready to take her back to her home, the huge towering bends at Brooklands. When we started this project, we had an old Model T chassis in a shed, plus some black and white photos of a car that was once a golden star. It looked a simple job, but it took five months. Now, this star is rekindled and back where she once shone, the racetrack at Brooklands.
Soon we hope to reunite her with her owner and watch him burn rubber up the famous Brooklyn's Test Hill. But first, there's an even more dangerous challenge. Well, today's the day we bring the Model T back to its original racing track at Brooklands. And this race... ...to die. It was dangerous then, it's even more dangerous now. It's full of enormous cracks and it's completely covered in moss and lichen, which make it extremely slippery. And I know we won't be able to change Claire's mind, but I really am worried about her driving on this. Then, as if to underline my fears, a fire tender turned up all the way from Heathrow. But oblivious to it all, Claire already had the engine sparked up and was getting some last-minute advice from Rod and McLaren veteran Chalky. You've got to be very careful with it. We've got no seat belts in the car, and you have to be really careful of the, the bumps and the potholes. Just let the car find its own way around and avoid, you know, obvious sort of hazards. And um, yeah. you've got very little in the way of brakes. You've got no shock absorbers, and the car will bounce a lot. Right. Stay out of the potholes, then. Potholes. Don't go too fast. Don't go too fast. Just remember, Claire, you've got no seat belts and no brakes, so keep out of the potholes and stay low on the banking, and you might just come back in one piece. Come on. Oh! I can't believe I'm driving at Brooklands in one of the world's first racing cars. The plan is to start with a couple of gentle runs to get the feel of the thing, then gun it as hard as I dare. But gentle is just not possible here. If this thing crashes, Van goes all of Neil's dreams. And also, selfishly, I'm going to find myself wrapped up in this tin can, which is not a nice way to go. There's only a mile of track here. That's all that's left of this historic circuit. Such a shame. After a few very bumpy runs, it was time to kick into top gear, yank the accelerator open, and just hope I stay on the track. Oh, I'm trying to get to speed up. Oh, oh this track is just too far gone to get up to any real speed. Just this car wants to get so fast that it really wants to be up the top of that bank. Oh, I'm to behave myself so much. Oh. So, Neil, the last time you saw this baby, it was just a chassis on wheels. Wow, look at that. What do you reckon? That is stunning. Better than I expected, without a doubt. Who would have thought a Model yeah. T Ford could look like that? Can't. I mean, the photographs don't show it like that, but it's, it is stunning, isn't it? I'm really thrilled. The Golden Ford. <laughs> it's the Golden Ford. You can see why. It's a hero. Yeah. Oh, go on in there. You better see if you can get in there. <laughs> I've been waiting long enough, so go I'm going to get in there. Go There's no on. doubt about that. He's going to fit, isn't he? I'm afraid He's so. He's going to fit. I'm never going to get this even car. With all, even with all this wiring, I'm going to get in there. <laughs> Look at that. Like a glove. <laughs> with the banking in such a state, we did the best we could, and it was very scary. But there's one place where we can push her even more. The famous Members Hill. A 352-foot-long hill climb at a gradient of one in four. Well, it's back to... Um... But before Neil takes on this challenge, there's one person who wants to see the Golden Ford while it's still in one piece. Clara Howard, A. E. George's daughter. I remember the car. Yeah. Well, I was very young, but I remember having my father having the body changed. Gosh, the Golden Ford. Golden, that's right. 
gosh. Oh, I love this racing days. Can I peer inside? Do. Yeah. Well, Neil, at Salvage Squad, we like to deliver. And you said your dream was to take this car on a hill climb. Well, now's your chance, my old mate. Best of British luck. Thank you very much. I'm going to go up to the top with a stopwatch. <laughs> right. And we'll see you up there we'll with any luck. We'll see you up the top. No problem. <laughs> come on, then. No dicky seat. No dicky seat. No dicky You're seat. You're going to come as passenger, then? Yeah. <laughs> we can so squeeze you in. Sit on there somewhere. You can sit on my lap. Oh, that would be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> it's a straight run, but it's very narrow. If Neil hits either side of the banking, he'll bounce back and forth like a pinball before ending up on his head. Best of British luck, Neil. It would be a lovely tribute to my father. Fantastic. Well, Quite an unnerving sight, sitting at the bottom and seeing that hill ahead of you. Really good. It's brilliant. Thank you very much, Claire. I'd be very pleased to know you did an extremely respectable nine and a half seconds. Well, that's not bad. I'm that's glad it's under the ten all. seconds. That's, yeah. that's all right. That's something else. No, congratulations. We were a bit worried. Though. It was wobbling halfway up. Yeah. Oh, well, that's because it's quite rough, but I was in control. Well, take a sip out of that. That's, what, oh, uh, that's worth every... Every racing champion does. Yes. Hey! <laughs> 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 The salvage squad tackles a mighty D-Day tank destroyer at the same time tomorrow. But after the break, American Chopper revs up for a Mikey special. The body sorted, and for that, I need a plan, man. I'm in the heart of the Ford Design Center for Europe. I've almost had to sign my life away to get in here. It's top secret. From here, all the designs are conceived. It's big business and it's big bucks. My contact is Matt Jones. He might look a bit art school, but I'm told he's a whiz on the computers. So, Matt, where did you start designing our bodywork? Well, we had these photos and not a lot of information on them. Took the measurements off the chassis and came up with this here. If you look at it from the front, you can see how we've put in the, the track dimensions and the chassis dimensions and the radiator. And all the bodywork is made from the photos, which is sort of guesswork, really. Oops, it's come out like that, and if we give it some colour, Lovely. it starts to look a little bit more like a, a yeah. car. Yeah. And how confident are you you've got something our body worker can work with? Um, reasonable, because luckily with this system we can, if we see a side view here, we can give him a drawing of that, and he'll be able to measure off the drawing, scale drawing, exactly what he needs to make the body. All right, here we are. With that done, it was time to get the plans off to our coach builder. Good luck. It's been great doing business with you. OK, <laughs> yeah. cheers. While Suggs was mucking around with supercomputers, I was heading north with my wobbly wheel to probably the only firm in the country who'd be able to fix it, Specialised Automobile Services. These guys are pretty much the best in the business. There's not a car worth owning that they've not made a wheel for. We've got Steve Hopkins, the big cheese himself, to straighten ours. Right then, Steve, are we going to see exactly how wobbly this is? Yeah, well, let's is? get it on the jig and see what happens. I'll hold it in position if you want to put the bolts on. This is pretty much the last chance saloon. If it doesn't work, there's no way we can make a press to stamp out a new one. We have to make it work. It looks fairly bad. It's not even sitting on the jig properly. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's just see exactly how far this is out. Well, it's quite wobbly on the car. Wow, look at that. That's terrible. How fast were you going with that? I got it up to 50 miles an hour. 50? And the guy in towards the track kept going, slow down, I'm not slow surprised. Down. I'm not surprised. That is absolutely horrendous. Yeah, what's actually <laughs> caused it to buckle like that? Well, looking at it, you've got a, a weld here. That's not the original manufacturer, is it? No, 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 no. I think... Sometime in its life, it's had a fatigue crack. Somebody's tried to weld it, do a repair weld. And as soon as you put any heat on a disc, and it's going to buckle exactly like that. Oh. So can we repair this? It's a difficult one. It's a very difficult one. I think the only way we're going to be able to do it is to cut round there, make a new 
centre, and hopefully, when we weld it back up again, <laughs> we don't have the same problem, <laughs> cos it's a buckle. What do you think the chance of success is? Well, putting any heat on a disc wheel like this always causes problems, so... slim to none, but we shall give it a try. Now, being organised, I sent the measurements on ahead and they've actually made up the central hub. Now, all we have to do, and I say all, is prepare the wheel and weld this in position. It probably won't work, but we don't really have a choice. We have to give it a go. The idea is to use the new hub as a flat surface on which to bolt our bent wheel. By tightening the nuts bit by bit, we should gently coax it back into shape. Okay, Kurt, let's get going. Is it time for the gas out? Yes. Hey. <laughs> this might seem crazy, but the first thing Steve must do is butcher our beloved wheel, cutting a hole for the new hub. Right, Claire, get a big hammer, we can knock it down now. There we go. Wind the monks up. With the hub fitted, it needs to go back on the jig and bit by bit, just a few thou at a time, Steve tightens the bolts, bringing the wheel back into alignment. Fighting. Ooh. Getting better all the time. Ooh. It's then we can begin to weld it all back up again. Now comes the hard bit. As soon as we go anywhere near the thin bits of metal with a welding torch, they're going to heat up, expand and buckle in all sorts of interesting ways. If we're not careful, we're going to end up creating a wheel worse than the original one we had. The alternative is to spend £30,000 on a brand new one. And we haven't got that money. This is the moment of truth. If we're going to fulfil our promise to Neil and get the car screaming at Brooklands once more, then this has got to work. There you go, Claire. What do you think of that? Oh, that's not bad at all, is it? Considering how it was before. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little bit of distortion there, but it's not too bad. I think we can live with that. Thanks very much. It's fantastic. You've got to do 150 mile an hour on that now. Yep, don't tempt me. I'm going to get that back to the workshop and straight on the car. The only thing we need now is a set of tyres. Rubber might start growing on trees, but before it's a tyre, the black stuff's going to have to spend some time with Dunlop, being pulled, stretched and rolled into shape, just as it was 90 years ago. The real skill begins when each of the layers is glued into place by hand and the edge is built up. This rubber band is then placed inside a vacuum mould to give it its basic shape. The final part of the process is sticking it in an oven, squirting in water and baking the lot at Gas Mark 4. The result?